Somebody's got a handout? Okay. I'll hang out in the back. I'm introducing Karen Inslee and her where did Brian? Brian, he went to grab some water. And Brian, they uh, formed their law firm, and they're one of our trusted referrals. Their information is very accurate. And uh, tomorrow, <coughs> you'll get to hear Karen and our friend Steve Badger uh, go at it, which I get to MC. Oh, I can't oh. wait. Please I can't either. They say I can't say get ready to rumble, because apparently that's trademarked, and you have to pay for that. And but I'll figure something else. Get almost ready to rumble. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's have Karen get started, and I think this will be a great class for you all. Thank you. Good morning. I suppose we are being recorded, so I'm speaking to y'all, and I'm speaking to the mythical those who come after who are going to be watching. So thank you so much for being here. This is uh, a really important topic. We're going to cover why you may or may not want to have W-2 employees in lieu of 1099s, what the benefits and the risks are of each business model. We're going to talk a little bit about W-2 compliance if we have time. Um, I have probably more information than we have time to share, so I'd love to be interrupted with questions. If you have a question, please do interrupt me. Uh, it's very early in the morning, and my mouth and my brain may not be synced yet, so... Let's give it a go. Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I'm good. So uh, these are my opinions. I think they're accurate, but I'm not giving anyone specific legal advice. You should all have an attorney that practices in the area of a construction law, and you should be talking to your attorney before you make any big decisions, including something along the lines of W-2 versus 1099. Oops. Okay, so when it comes to 1099 versus W-2, I get a lot of calls about this, and there's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there and misunderstanding about this topic, and that's why we're here talking about it today, because it's not what you call somebody, and it's not how you pay them. It's how much control you exert over that person that really determines whether they are in fact an employee or an independent contractor. 1099 is independent contractor. 1099 is simply the way someone is paid. Uh, it's Form 1099 that gets issued at the end of the year. So there you go. But it's all about control. So um, why should you care? The first reason is tax liability. It is more expensive for the employer to have a W-2 employee versus a 1099. There are taxes associated with that. So uh, a lot of companies, when they're starting up, it's having your own business is complicated. There's lots of challenges. Things are happening all the time. It's just crazy fire hose world for a long time. And so the simple thing is to just have your, especially salespeople, which are the kind of the focus of the 1099 world here for roofing contractors, uh, the easy thing is to have a 1099. If they sell something, they get a commission. If they don't, they don't. You don't have to deduct anything. You don't have to pay payroll taxes. You simply write them a check for their whatever percentage is or however it is that you pay them. So um, when you have an employee, you have to hold, withhold taxes. You have to pay those taxes timely. You have to report the taxes quarterly. It's a thing, right? <coughs> and so for some people, that's really daunting, and they don't want to mess with it, and it's just simpler to have a 1099, and so um, they do. Uh, there's uh, federal income tax, and thank goodness we live in Texas. There's no state income tax, yay. Um, and so these are the kind of taxes that you're going to have to be taking out of paychecks for W-2s. Um, the big deal is the audit, right? Nobody wants to get audited. How many of you have ever had an audit? W, good, that's good. Yeah? Yeah, they suck, don't they? Yeah, I talked to a, a contractor last night, and he said he got audited when he first went into business for himself, but there was only him, and so the auditor comes to his kitchen table and sits down, and he's like, you know, who works for you? He says, me. <laughs> and about three questions in, the fellow folds up his uh, folder, and he says, thank you very much, and he leaves. So 
a single person is not really uh, the target of, the aud of, of an audit. It's really the larger contractors who are not paying taxes, and that is the subject of the audit. Good morning. There's handouts somewhere back there. If you want to grab one, if you don't, that's great. Anybody who wants a handout, I'm happy to provide one. Uh, shoot, yeah, Brian or my, this is Brian Benitez, he's my partner. I'm not used to having anyone here to present with me, so sorry, this is Brian. He's the uh, smarter half of my brain. <coughs> so uh, anyway, I talked to someone else. I've talked to several people actually um, in the last few weeks that have been audited. In fact, just went through an audit with a client of mine who was a, a large contractor and had an almost exclusively 1099 model. And it was interesting, we'll talk about that later. So uh, what triggers an audit? Normally it is a disgruntled uh, person who leaves and files an unemployment claim. That is the, I think, the most common uh, way that an audit gets started. Uh, a competitor can report you. Uh, competitors love to report, you know, all kinds of things. Um, that's just the, the nature of the world, right? Uh, and then um, there are random audits that are performed. I don't know that, you know, you, they normally will not tell you why they're auditing. So you can't really ever know. In fact, this one client was audited in 2021, and the audit sort of fizzled out, which is strange, unusual. And, uh, and it went pretty far down the road, too, but there, they never came back with any sort of results. So we gave them all the information, and there was just lots of it. And then they never came back with the result, and then two years later, they got audited again. And I said, hey, can you tell me why we're getting audited again? And they said, oh, it's random. So, which I totally don't believe. But anyway, um, there is a, they do audit 2%, and they do occasionally uh, pick a industry and audit an industry. So in the 80s, it was hairdressers for some reason. So why do they do it? Um, to get revenue, that's why. They, they uh, Texas Workforce Commission, has a, um, a basic belief that everybody should be an employee and they want taxes paid and so they, they are just like um, just like worker injuries um, there, there is a presumption that someone is an employee and you really are if you get audited you really are fighting that presumption so why do you care? Lawsuits, uh, back pay can be assessed. Liquidated damages for knowing violations can be assessed, and they can be pretty steep. And uh, criminal penalties as well as civil penalties. So I hear this a lot. Well, they signed a 1099 agreement. Well, TWC doesn't care. Department of Labor doesn't care. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission does not care what they signed. <coughs> They, uh, it, it's a factor. Let me put it that way. It's a factor, but it's not de a determinative factor. Uh, and one of the things that can trigger an audit is um, your 1099 um, reporting at the end of the year and tax returns. So the IRS has the ability to compare those. And if they don't match, that can trigger an audit as well. And Brian's just going to chime in. <clears throat> I can't see him, so... Uh, if he chimes in, I've asked him to. He's not interrupting me um, for no reason other than I've left something out and there's something he wants to add. I'm um, prepared to address this from the perspective of our family. There you go. Okay. So who can audit you? The Texas Workforce Commission, the Department of Labor, that's feds. Uh, equal Employment Opportunity, that's the feds. And I don't like any government entity of any kind. I'm just saying. I don't want to get letters from them. I don't want to get calls from them. I want to have as little interaction with Big Brother as possible. So I want to do everything I can do to avoid that. That's just me personally. There are other folks that have um, different levels of risk tolerance. And this is really about risk tolerance when you're making a decision of which way you want to go with how you want to um, manage your workforce. Uh, I have some clients who have absolutely no W-2 employees whatsoever. And the TWC auditor told me during one of the audits that we've done together 
that uh, she just didn't believe it was possible to have no W-2s at all. And I wanted to say I agree with you, except I couldn't. So it really is possible. Uh, and at a minimum, your administrative people, if, if they're not the owner, um, would be W-2 employees, because really they don't have in all likelihood, the ability to manage themselves, right? So, um, almost certainly somebody needs to be uh, a W-2 employee in your company. But project managers are oftentimes uh, 1099s, and salespeople are very often 1099s. And uh, because they have greater control, presumably over how and what they do, if that makes more sense, I think that's an easier sell. So here's the taxes, if you guys want to know about the taxes. I think taxes is what we're talking about. Okay, there's fines. So I don't know, I don't need to read these to you. There's fines, they're significant, and nobody likes to pay fines. Uh, FLSA is the federal, what is that one? Yeah, Fair Labor Standards Act, thank you. Uh, so, a misclassification of an employee is going to not only affect or trigger a TWC audit, but the FLSA may decide to come after you as well. So this is all the scary bad stuff, I'm sorry, it sounds really very <coughs> bad, but this is reality, right? So this is, this is all the downside stuff. Uh, there's penalties, back wages, FLSA generally is larger companies, but so it's all about control. So the Texas Workforce Commission has 20 common law factors that it looks at when it is deciding whether someone is a 99 or a W-2. And let's talk about those. 20. 20. Which means they're giving themselves a lot of Yeah, 20 chances. They have 20 chances to decide that somebody is an employee. That's what it really means, right? Uh, there are factors. They're all, um, there's no factor necessarily that's weighed more heavily than the other. It's not like you have to get 11 out of 20. Uh, they can literally pick one factor and decide that you are um, misclassif misclassifying your employees and they can assess uh, penalties as, uh, accordingly. So, and that's just their opinion? Mm -hmm. Sure, that's their opinion. Mm -hmm. So, the first thing they do, yeah, if you've never been through an audit, and I'm sorry, I just can't see that. That's so small. I don't want to turn that back to you, so let me get a bigger. I love this computer because it's small and it's easy to travel with, but I can't see it. <laughs> so, I don't know. Anyway, so um, when you get an audit, the first thing you get is a, a hello letter for getting audited. I want you to give me, and there's a laundry list of stuff. Sometimes it's email, but usually it's a letter. Please contact us. Here's the laundry list of things that I want you to send me. And it's pretty invasive. And they can ask for your tax returns. They're certainly going to ask for all your payable records. They're going to ask for all your, they're going to ask for your general ledger. Because they're going to look through every single check you've written in your company. And it's a three-year look back, typically. So they're going to ask for all this information. They're going to dig, dig, dig. They're going to say, well, you didn't give me this, and you didn't give me that. This don't match up, so I think I'm missing something, and paper, 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 paper. And then they're gonna to want to have a conversation, and not because I'm a lawyer, but honestly, if you are gonna be audited, I would suggest that you uh, get with a professional, it doesn't have to be a lawyer, maybe it's your CPA. This is not the kind of thing you wanna do on your own. Because there are ways to present things, there are questions to ask, there are ways to answer questions that can be helpful or hurtful. And so I, I recommend it, um, that, you, that you don't do this on your own, or they say don't try this at home. So um, the first factor is instructions, and that's uh, what level of instruction the employer is giving the individual providing the services. Uh, here in italics is uh, the definition of an independent contractor. Here uh, in, I guess not italics, is TWC's definition of an employee. So an employee receives instructions about when, where, and how the work is to be performed. So um, it really starts with that, right? And um, if they decide that you are telling them when, where, and how to perform, they are going to be an employee. Don't even really bother with the other 19. 
So how does that work where we get uh, a general contractor sends us a work order, tells us where, when, and what the scope of work is. <coughs> right, so Even where are we fill out all their paperwork that says we're an independent contractor? Right, so the question is, how does that work when general contractors can tell you where, when, and how, right? So it's really about means and methods. So if the general contractor says, here's where the, and you guys are general contractors, uh, and, and you have an independent contractor, if you tell them, uh, I want you to, this is the job, uh, this is the scope, and this is what it needs to be done. So that, that doesn't automatically turn someone into an employee, but when you say start on this side, and go this direction, and you're going to put so many nails in each shingle, right? And you're going to make sure when you start handling, you start delving into the means and methods. That's when you turn someone into. Uh, that's when that relationship changes simply from uh, independent contractor to employee. And so on a commercial level, it's it's that simple. Practically speaking, if we're talking about salespeople. So if you say, I want you to go door knock that street, I want you to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning, I want you to start on that side, here's the script I want you to use, here is how many doors you have to knock by noon, here is the report that you have to give me when you're done, right, when you start doing that, that level of control, that is what's going to get you in trouble. So, yes, sir? Are there um, ways to, we'll say, inspire or induce it? <coughs> Yeah, training, it's not mandatory, but if you don't go to training, you don't get company leads. You're responsible for your own lead development. And so, I'm withholding the benefit, if you will. That's the wrong word in this context. You are, you are incentivizing. Incentivizing their ongoing training. Yeah, so. It's not required. Right, so one of the factors is training, right? If you require someone to come to training, that's a factor. If you offer training so that they can grow their skills, that's not, that's, right, that's, that's not, that's not, that's a factor, that's the other side. <coughs> so if you say, if you come to training, I'm going to give you leads, that's an incentivization. That doesn't turn them into an employee. It's when you, it's when you dictate what they have to do and how they have to do it, that that's when you start getting yourself in trouble. So then training, right? Um, if you offer it, and you should, see, here's the problem. You have standards that you want your company to be governed by, right? You want consistency in your interactions out in the public. You want your brand represented in a way that you want it represented. That's really hard to do with the 1099 because you can't really tell them you have to this and you have to that. You can have minimum standards, but it's like, you know, restaurant franchises. Some of them are really, really tight, and it doesn't matter what McDonald's you go to, their Happy Meal is their Happy Meal is their Happy Meal. There are other franchises, and I can't think of any right now, that I've been to, and it's like, oh, I'm not in blah, blah land anymore, right? And so that's kind of the differentiating factor, and that's why I, one of the reasons why I recommend the W-2, because you have more control over the quality of your output, and that helps with referrals and all kinds of things. So we talked about training. I really don't understand what integration means. <coughs> Unless it means that there are some core duties that are so important to your business that can't really be outsourced. Because 1099 is really about outsourcing, right? So for instance, uh, supplement companies are paid as a 1099. They're independent contractors, right? Um, and they you are what kind of supplement companies? Right. And certainly you're, you know, the, the person who puts on your gutters and your roof and, you know, window screen and paint and all that stuff. They are all independent contractors. Do I run out of time for anybody watching? I'm watching. We have 26 minutes remaining. Awesome. Okay. Uh, services personally rendered. Um, one, of the, one of the questions is do you, make, do you make the person do the work themselves or do they have the right to outsource it to others and hire others to work under them? And if you require the services to be personally provided, smart, because you don't want just any Yahoo out there, you know, knocking doors for you, right? Or, or responding to, it doesn't have to be door knocking, it can be anything. By the way, I love door knocking. I don't know how people know that there's a service out there if you don't bring it to them and make them aware of it. So I'm not anti-door knocking in any, any respect at all. But um, 
you don't necessarily want somebody's brother or cousin just out of prison or not, right? Or, you know, um, you know showing up in a holy t-shirt and your ripped jeans or whatever. You don't want that. You want to know who's representing you and you want to know that they're doing it in the way that they have been hopefully trained to do. So, um, services personally rendered is a big thing. Um, hiring, supervising, paying helpers. Continuing relationship, this is a big deal. Um, I like independent contractor agreements and I'm a big fan of them. Um, I like them to be open-ended and not expire during, you know, from a certain time period. Because if they expire a year, you have to go do it over. Just one more thing you have to do. Not a fan of having to do things over and you can avoid it. So, um, but that is uh, one of the factors that they do look at. Set hours of work, that's a big deal. So set hours of work. And I see that a lot with my clients with their independent contractor salespeople. Um, really, if they want to make one sale a month, or they want to make 40 sales a month, if they're truly independent contractors, you can't complain about it. You're paying for their one sale, or you're paying for their 40 sales. Um, location where the services are performed, we talked about saying, you know, that's the neighborhood I want you to knock this week. Um, ordering or sequencing work is a factor. Requiring reports is a factor, and I um, was a little surprised about that. Because you can require your independent contractors to give you daily logs, right? If, if, and you should. If you are doing commercial construction of any kind, you should have photographs. We should have photographs no matter what kind of construction, but photographs and daily logs from anybody who's working for you, whether it's your foreman, whether it's your subcontractors. So this this would lead one to believe that TWC doesn't like daily logs and they think that that's an independent contractor uh, factor, but, but that's why they're factors. Because when they're taken in totality and they're weighed and how they're used and what they look like, etc. cetera. Uh, payment by the hour, week or month is a factor. And that makes sense, right? Because you're looking at how long they've been working for you. And if they them with a computer and a phone and a ladder and a truck. Hats and shirts. Hats and shirts. So here's the thing about hats and shirts. Thank you for asking that question because um, I think the way to handle the hat and shirt is you pay them $50 a month to do advertising for you and the hat and the shirt is an advertising mechanism. Right? So then they're not wearing it because you're making them. They're wearing it because you're paying them to advertise for you. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, great. But realizing profit and loss is actually a very big factor that you need to think about. Yes, sir. Um, so on the profit and loss, uh, what, what if, like, they, I mean, since they're on the independent contractor, they're not going to make profit the way we look at it is if they sell a job, right? So what if they lost 100 jobs and they're only making 50 
jobs we can't sell one of them. Technically, we haven't done a lot for fuel time. Well, that's their lot. So, so the question is, um, they don't sell anything. They have a, there's a loss of fuel and time, but that's their loss because they're providing their own fuel, and it's their own time. But if you sell a, a, a project, and instead of making money, the project loses money. If it's the roofing contractor and they put the shingles on upside down, right? <coughs> They're going to come back and take that off and put the shingles back on the right way. So there's a financial loss associated with that that the contractor is going to uh, share. But no subcontractor takes a hit in the GC takes a loss. I mean, sure I'm not going to go to my electrician and be like, sorry, I screwed this pooch. Okay, I if you're if I you're doing his job, and so you have to take a lot. Now he made the mistake specifically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So when it comes to a trade, if if you hire a trade and the trade makes a mistake, it's, they're going to have to fix it. That's a loss to them. If you're, I just had this conversation with a, a client a couple days ago. Uh, they had a new salesperson who uh, costed out the job incorrectly, sold it as a retail job, and they're going to lose money. In that case, it makes sense if they're truly independent contractors that that salesperson is going to realize their, their pro rata percentage of the loss. That's what I'm talking about. Job goes bad, and the company's going, it's going to cost the company $10,000, and that salesperson gets 15% of the profit. It's going to cost that salesperson $1,500, and that's going to come out of a future um, that's what I'm talking about. Well, he can draw it back at his poor performance, right? Yeah, he sold the job. Yeah, so what if uh, so what if the the sales guy he sold the job, the owner bid it wrong, or the the, uh, the supplier and the, and the owner were talking and they, they bid the wrong, um, and they were we we lost like eight grand. Um, does the sales guy still get? So if it's not the sales guy's fault, I wouldn't necessarily punish the sales guy. But there are some, there are some contracts with sales people where they get 15% whether the job makes money or not. If they make, if they make money whether the job makes money or not, then shouldn't they lose money if the job, right? So it's a matter of being fair, and it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of being fair. First. And if it's not the salesperson's fault, I wouldn't necessarily punish the salesperson. But it just depends on your agreement and uh, with the salesperson on how their uh, profits are calculated. I was the sales manager. <coughs> so, oh, right. Yeah, and I, I lost. Yeah, I, I, right. So it just, it just depends. Good morning, John. But there should be yeah. some shaded risk in the independent contract, so, contract that if they don't perform. Yeah, if anybody who makes a mistake should be responsible for their mistake. That's what a true independent contractor is. You don't do that with an employee. If one of my employees makes a mistake and they, I don't know, whatever, right? I, I pay to fix that because that's my job, right? Because I mean, we're the business owner, so that's our job. Uh, that's not true for independent contractors. Uh, so, right to discharge without liability, working for more than one firm at a time. So that's, right, that's, um, I don't think there's anybody here that wants to have one of their salespeople go sell for them better, right? Uh, and TWC looks really hard at that, and that is almost a, a no-go. So, it's very difficult to say someone's independent if they can't sell for someone else. Very, very hard. Uh, it's a little bit different for your subcontractors who you just keep so busy that there's no reason for them to go looking for other work. Uh, but especially for salespeople and project managers, it's a really hard sell if, if they're not able to go sell for somebody else. Uh, making services available to the public, that doesn't really apply mostly to what we're talking about here. Right to discharge without liability. So this is really interesting. Um, you, can, you can't really fire somebody for no reason or any reason at all. There are some reasons why you can't fire somebody, but Texas is an Apple state, right? So if you just decide that you, you just don't want somebody at the office anymore, as long as you're not terminating them for a prohibited reason, you can let them go. You can't fire a subcontractor for no reason in the middle of a job and say, yeah, well, I just decided I don't want you to do this anymore, so you're out and I'm not paying you any money. It just doesn't work that way in the real world. Um, and then they have the right to quit. Without liability, same same kind of deal. You, you know, you have.
had a roofing contractor in the middle of the job decide that they just, um, they decided they're gonna go on vacation, they're not gonna finish the roof. Yeah, sorry, I'm just leaving, right? Well, that's not gonna work. So the same thing is true whether you're hiring or whether they're quitting. We're we'll talking about EEOC and federal. Federal, sure. So the federal partner to this is the Department of Labor. They're the kind of bigger Texas Workforce Commission. They put a rule out for rule writing in 21. I took some notes on it, sorry. So 21, the federal government's got a rule, and basically the purpose of this is to take what Karen was talking about, which is the Texas context, and move it into the federal context because you are subject to audit and control by both layers of government, which is super great, but that's the way it is. She talked about the why, um, and you heard her version of it, which is revenue, which is certainly a why. My version of it is I think there's just a culture of control, and some of these things go back to cases from the Depression era. You ever heard that phrase, you know, you're on the dole? It's kind of an older phrase, but that used to mean if you're on assistance, you were on the dole. It's an older way of saying you're on the dole or something like that. So this kind of branches off for me a little bit in our world because I think this discussion takes place both primarily with salespeople, but then also, you know, with the crews that you hire. So the crews you hire are always, quote unquote, independent. But again, if they work only for you all the time, maybe they're not so independent. They probably don't have the option to profit based on, you know, if the job goes south, you're usually going to pay your labor sub. If you're a sales guy, you may reconcile with him at the end of a job, but you're paying the labor guy. So it, it does get a little different when we're comparing your subcontract to labor. Three other factors, degree of skill required for the work, degree of permanence of the worker in the relationship, and then whether or not they're part of an integrated unit of production. We're talking about that. I mean, do they, are they really get the guts and the core of the business, or are they ancillary? Because the federal case law basically looks at it and says, Independent contractors are commonly used for things that are not super, super core. So that would be a case-by-case -case test, but it, I, I don't know how this is going to come down. This rule hasn't been interpreted yet by federal courts. It hasn't even technically been written, but it is coming. So they're going to look at it and say either, well, the core of your business is selling, roofing, and construction jobs. I mean, for, for sure you're selling people are going to get caught up in it. But then the question, I suppose, is going to be your labor subs. Are they core to the can you run the business without them? Clearly you can, right? But the options for hiring labor crews is very, very different than the salespeople, the training, the connection. Just the one guy's going out and representing your company, flying the flag, doing all the things you want to do, pushing forward your company, 
policy in your brain. The other people are, you couldn't do it without them, but their role is different. So I suspect that the true independent contractor labor crew will probably get a pass as long as they are truly independent. And so I think the best way to look at this is, because we could what if it to death. This is my, my, my favorite example. If you go to an independent insurance agent who sells for State Farm and Farmers and Allstate, well, all these control things that we've talked about, that person can sell policy for you know, company A, company B, company C. But what if State Farm just pulls out? Well, he can go sell more Allstate, he can sign up Amica. I mean, he, he's free to work for different companies over here selling their products to a group of customers over here. He's completely independent with what he sells and to whom he sells it. That's a true independent person, but our, our roof salespeople, I don't think, fall into that category very often. Yes, sir? So, and obviously we've been doing all that stuff, but we're right around right, 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 what we can bring it to. What about real estate? You have a broker and you have real estate agents that are all 1099 and work under a broker, but they only work for that one agency. They're required to go into the office, they build in to make all <coughs> So how come real estate doesn't have to abide by anything? Maybe they do, and I'm just not aware. But well, one, they have to abide by it. Two, I think it loops around to something you had mentioned, and I didn't want to interrupt, but you were asking about, um, I think, lead generation. Yeah, right. um, the brokers uh, here are the brokers definitely have a lot of control. Carol was talking about it in the context at that time of tools, so if you give them the hammers and the air pressure, well, that just links you more to them and you control them. CRM is a little different, because I think in the, in the example you said you have to attend company training. You can attend company training, you just don't get leads unless you do. Right. So if you attend company training, then company leads. But if not, then no company leads. And they go out and generate their own leads, I suppose. So that, if I was an auditor testing that, that's not, that's not a common situation. It's not crazy, not uncommon, but it's not the most common. <coughs> so that would train itself toward that salesperson is an independent salesperson because they are free. Well, I guess they're free to go sell for other people or are they? We are very clear to our guys because this scares them out of me. Uh, there was some guy like six, seven months ago that got audited and like ended up having to go bankrupt. Uh, that scares the piss out of me. Um, so we tell all our guys very clear that you can go sell whatever you want to. I'm going to provide such a value as a company, as a trainer, as a guy that you want to work for. You're only going to want to sell to me. It's almost fine. You're free to sell for somebody else. They know that. Uh, they may not repeat that because they're not only right, but that's what we tell them. That's what's in the contract. They're stated, you can work for someone else, but I'm gonna take care of you. You're no, that makes sense. And so in a, in a case like that, so real estate people are subject to it. And if a real estate person, the salesman works for a broker, and the broker kind of locks them down and gives them the lead and says, where is your blue blazer and your help in, they're gonna, they're gonna fall right into this just like I've never seen a lot of the agent work for different brokers. There, there's another aspect though too though. Realtors work under a broker who is licensed as a broker and there may be some legal <coughs> thing there where the realtor is bound as a broker because the broker is their protection and provision. They make sure they follow laws, etc. There may be something else there going on that I don't know about. It's not unlike um, a bunch of journeyman plumbers working under a master plumber's license. It's very similar to that. But they're not immune from this law. There's no carve out for real estate people. So if like Karen was saying sometimes certain things become enforcement priorities. Remember, in my practice, I do a lot of this type of stuff, agency law, defending our clients against various claims. So uh, two and a half, three years ago, Falls became a huge priority for OSHA. We have six minutes, and I have one minute. <coughs> I will. So the, the end test, here's the, here's the conclusion here. What they're going to test for is the actual practice between the worker and the employer. So in their instance, sir, if your guys are actually going out and fulfilling or selling for other people or bringing contracts to multiple workers to fulfill, you're going to be in good shape. And this is uh, a court case that, a quote from a court case that is shaping this rule. If the nature of a business requires a company to exert control over its workers, then that company must hire employees, not independent contractors. So your salespeople are almost all certainly going to want to be. Can, can you repeat that? Sure. Is it on this right now somewhere? No. Okay. Now, this is from a fairly recent court case. If the nature of a business requires a company to exert control over its workers, 
then that company must hire employees, not independent contractors. And so that's going to become an enforcement issue where they're not, they're going to be looking at you and you and you, and then over the course of a year or two or three, they will amalgamate enough data to where they might start making sweeping rules against, no, not against, I shouldn't say that, but with regard to certain industries. So that might be the next step, depending on how this plays out. Can you tell me what the, what the name of that case law or that? Yeah, Chow, C-H-A-O, versus First National Lending Corporation. And the number of it, it just type it in, you'll see, 516-F.S-U-P-P, uh, which is Federal Reporter Supplemental. 2D is the next thing you would type in, second edition, 895, which is the page. So 2006 case from the Northern District of Ohio, and in this kind of law and world, that is pretty reasonable. Yeah, and certainly let us know, Brian, we'll be happy to uh, provide that case law to you if you've got to look it up. Uh, so, we, we talked about all this. You're, you're the pluses and minuses. What I really wanted to is make sure that we covered is I wanted to give you the results of the Texas Workforce Commission audit that uh, we just wrapped up. And there's 20 factors, right? And the only thing the auditor cared about was which of the salespeople had signed a, uh, or, I'm sorry, which of the salespeople had an FBI so if the wages were being reported under a social security number, they were considered an employee. And if they were an LLC, an Inc, and whatever, anything. Anything that had a federal employment ID, FEIN is federal employment identification, identification number. number. So when you set up a business, instead of using your social security number, you, you get a federal employment number. And that's how the taxes are reported. And everybody who had an FEIN, was considered an independent contractor, and everyone who had a social security number was considered an employee. And the penalties and taxes were assessed accordingly. Fortunately for my client, they had transitioned almost exclusively to LLCs, uh, requiring that all of their salespeople have LLCs. So it's not the law, it's not the only factor. But if you, if you do like the 1099 model, and you want to use it, at the least that I would say is make sure that all of your people are set up as an LLC or an Inc or whatever. Uh, there are tax advantages to them. There are advantages to you, and, and here's one of them. Uh, so I, I just, I was just, I was like, what? <laughs> did they do that with the crews or just the sales team? They did it with everybody, the crews and the sales team. Anybody who had an FEIN was, was an independent contractor and anyone who was, and they had a, they had a roofing crew who was being paid uh, as an individual and they were considered employees. So it wasn't just salespeople versus crews, it was literally social security number, FEIN, that was it. That was the- Is that crew working available to work for other companies? There was no difference, there was no difference at all. They had, I don't know, a dozen different subcontracting crews of various kinds. No difference at all between how they were treated. They all signed the same contract. It was Social Security number, FEIN. How, how finicky are auditors? One auditor wants this, one auditor wants that, or you know, The auditor in Houston wanted to know whether the, uh, the salespeople were subject to penalties for losses on jobs. So it's really like, who do you get? Yeah. It so is based on their opinion. A lot of it's based on their opinion. It, they're factors. So here's the problem. They're factors, uh, they're opinions. There are, it, it's just, um, you just, it depends on who you get as an auditor. And getting, a, getting one of these things overturned is just ridiculous, it just doesn't happen. And so you're hoping you get, you get a really good auditor, you hope you build great rapport, you hope they're really busy and they can't be bothered to, to slam you, but you know, the contractor who filed bankruptcy because, so, um, so anyway, in the rest of the paper is um, federal I-9 requirements. If you're gonna use a, a, a W-2 model, uh, your people have to fill out I-9s, you have to, uh, that information is uh, highly confidential, you have to keep it separate, I would, uh, and there's all this uh, stuff, so, and, and then uh, you cannot, by the way, you cannot require a certain document for someone to, to prove that they are eligible to work in the United States. 
So there's a, a list of documents. Oh, Brian, that's us. Hang on. Sure. I know. I don't know how to stop it. It's an Android. I don't get Androids. <laughs> so, uh, so the rest. Sorry. So, uh, when someone's filling out an I nine, uh, which is the which is how they uh, show that they're eligible to work in the United States, there's a list of documents that, and this and uh, these are attachments to the uh, to the handout. So all these documents are here. There's a, there's a list of documents that somebody can provide to prove that they're eligible to work in the United States. They have to have something off the A list and something off the B list. You cannot say, I want this document off of A and this document off of B. You cannot say, that picture doesn't really look like you. I don't think that's you. Give me something else. Now, if the picture is me and the name is John Smith and John Smith, as he sits in front of you as a 20-year-old man who's a bodybuilder, probably that's not me, right? But, you know, it's like your passport picture or your driver's license picture or whatever, right? If it doesn't really look, you can't say, that doesn't look enough like you, I'm going to reject that document. So it's, it's kind of interesting. You have to, they have to provide the documents that are required to prove they're eligible, but you can't really pick through the documents and be too particular about them. So it's an interesting area of law. We have a whole presentation on it. I think it's interesting. Most people don't think it's interesting, but it's only interesting for compliance purposes, right? So there's all kinds of things that are associated with that. Uh, it's handled in here, and you're welcome to look at it. Um, but we're out of time. And sir, you had a question, so before we go, I wanted to make sure we answered your question. Uh, yeah, my question was for salespeople, <clears throat> you make them or ask them to sign an NDA. Is that do anything towards W-2 or ten or nine or whatever? So a non-disclosure agreement uh, just means you're keeping your top secret information top secret, and that doesn't turn anybody into uh, a 1099 or or a W-2. Personally, I'm a big fan of NDAs. Um, depending on how much access somebody has to your top secret information, you certainly do want those signed. Um, the non-competition agreement, now that's something different, right? So when you, it's, we, we talked about non you're not allowing someone to sell for someone else, is, is a big factor with most auditors. The client that uh, just went through the audit, their uh, sales agreement says that they can sell to, for others by permission. So, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The, the results of the audit were just so not in keeping with the factors. It was just hard for me to, I don't know. It was crazy. Anyway, but the point being, you don't really know what you're going to get. So if you are happy with that level of risk and you're okay with just kind of rolling the dice and hoping you never get audited or thinking you're going to talk your way out of it or if you're too small for them to care, whatever the case may be, right, then... Um, otherwise, you may just want to consider what's the best business model for your company. And we thank you. Well, if you have any other questions before, yes, sir. Is there, um, you probably with the is there kind of a size of company that you know? Yeah, so the question is, is there a size of company? Um, no, I've seen smaller companies. I don't, I don't know, the smallest company that we saw get audited was maybe 10 or 12 guys. <coughs> well, they weren't a big company. So, um, but, but I did say that there was, yeah, somebody was just a single guy and the audit didn't go anywhere, so, yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but here's the thing, and you come on up, JP. The thing is that um, auditors want to get the most bang for their buck, and so they're, they're, I think, inclined to go after the bigger companies. Okay, thanks very much, you guys. I appreciate your time. Um, if you want a copy of this electronically, let us know. We'll be happy to provide that to you.